that I find difficult about being autistic is having to come to terms with the fact that there are some things and experiences that I will never be able to have. This doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with being autistic. I just look around me and see so many people being able to have these experiences that I long for that I won't have access to. I would love to be able to just go travel on my own or have the ability to go to a doctor's appointment without requiring an advocate to help with communication or be able to live on my own without having people having to come and help to make sure that I'm safe and not dying. I find myself sometimes getting lonely when I have to depend so much on others to be able to safely access and experience the world around me. One thing that I have found has helped with this feeling is creating a safe environment where I can enjoy things that I love, which has been amazing, but I think it's okay to sometimes still miss not being able to have those experiences. It helps to acknowledge it. If there's one thing Republicans can agree on, it's that criminal investigations should disqualify you from being president. Unless, of course, it's Donald Trump. Because it turns out everything they said about Hillary Clinton hits a little bit too hard if you pretend it's about today. Can you imagine the, the um, president-elect is under indictment, possibly ended up with a, with a felony? It's just like a little too on the nose. And I don't mean just from people like Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck. I mean from Trump's own mouth. We could very well have a sitting president under felony indictment and ultimately a criminal trial. Just a friendly reminder that Hillary Clinton wasn't indicted for anything, much less four times. She has done many criminal acts. She's not allowed to run. She is not allowed to be running in this election. It's not like the pundits are any better. This year, they've compared indictments against Trump to Stalin, Stalin, and also Stalin. But when you look back at what they said in 2016, it's a totally different story. We cannot have a country led by a president subject to ongoing criminal investigations. Are you saying we're, we're in for at least two years of investigations? If you're under your second FBI investigation in the same year, then you do have a problem corruption and ethics problem. And yes, I know Republicans can't survive without hypocrisy, but even this feels like a little bit much. All of these examples came from this excellent piece by my colleagues Jane Lee, Helena Hind, and Alicia Sadowski. You can find it on the Media Matters page. Please check it out. It might make you want to tear your hair out, but what else is new? You've probably seen this tarot deck before, but what do you know about the woman who illustrated it? The Rider Waite Tarot has been one of the most popular decks since it was created in 1909, but the woman who illustrated it rarely ever gets a mention. Pamela Coleman Smith, known as Pixie, was a likely sapphic and biracial artist from the UK. She was part of an occult society called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where she met the occult leader, Arthur Edward Waite, who asked her to illustrate this tarot deck. Even though her illustrations changed the way tarot was interpreted, she was the first person to illustrate the minor arcana with whole scenes. When the deck was released, she received neither credit nor royalties. Much of her history wasn't documented, as was the case with many women of colour. But we do know that Pamela also worked closely with the suffragette movement, using her art to fight for women's rights. She never married and spent over 20 years living with her likely lover, Nora Lane. To acknowledge her contribution to tarot, many people now refer to this deck as the Waite Smith deck to finally give Pamela Coleman Smith the credit she deserves. Let's talk about how misogyny and homophobia are harmful to straight men. Growing up in the 90s, I received constant messaging about all the things that'll make me too much like a girl and therefore gay. Eating a popsicle in public, using a urinal next to another boy, hanging out with girls, liking girls as people, crossing my leg over my knee, watching a chick flick with a chick, being flexible, using a straw, expressing emotions other than anger. So much of how I shaped myself and my relationships centered around the fear of being perceived as gay, the performative rejection of homosexuality, and sometimes the fear of being gay. I couldn't explore my full identity with those constraints. I couldn't form emotionally vulnerable relationships. I couldn't even acknowledge my own emotions if I was gonna be accepted. Every emotion that I felt had to be suppressed or channeled into anger. As an adult, that's left me with a half empty emotional toolbox. You come to me with an emotional problem and I'm jumping straight to the logic of it because I never learned to engage with my own emotions, much less yours. So now I find myself complaining that nobody cares about men's emotions while having no idea how to express my emotions because I had denied myself the practice to fit in. And even if I could fully feel and express my emotions, so few people are able to receive emotional vulnerability from a man because they grew up in the same suppressive world that I did. As men, we can't be too close. We can't meet to just talk. I can't tell you I love you. I can't tell you when I'm hurting or sad, only what's happened and how I'm overcoming it because I'm a man and as a man, I'm stoic and unshaken. It's isolating. 
I have unconscious homophobic biases that I've applied to myself. Because of that, I'm less emotionally available for my wife, I struggle to meet kids at their emotional level, and I have barriers that limit my friendship with men and my understanding of myself. I need to challenge homophobia for my own well-being. I think we can unlearn the hateful stereotypes that shape our behaviors, but it starts with us questioning, where did I learn this and why? Many of our thought patterns were imposed on us, and as we unlearn them, we unchain ourselves and become more free. How have you identified and unlearned some of your unconscious biases? Let me know your thoughts, experiences, and stories in the comments. Dr. Chomsky, what would your recommendation be for corporations? Just should they be eliminated, or is there a, is there a trend toward changing them, adapting them to the democratic ideals? Well, uh, my feeling about corporations is very much like my feeling about Bolshevism and fascism. Uh, to which they, which they resemble. Uh, in a short-term period, you want to reform them. Okay? So if you're living under, say, the rule of a king, you know, uh, it makes sense to plead with the king to, be, to act more kindly to his subjects. You know? uh, and that's always good. You know? Instead, so don't torture as many people and you know, give more gifts to poor people and so on. And that makes good sense. Uh, when the population of the United States by 20 to 1 says that corporations ought to sacrifice profits for communities and uh, workers, that 95% majority is saying the king ought to be more benevolent, not so harsh. Uh, and that's good. I agree with that. The king ought to be more benevolent. But of course, you can go a little further and say, is the institution legitimate at all? And I don't think it is, uh, uh, for the reasons I discussed. So therefore, it ought to be dismantled. Uh, and workers ought to be the masters of their own industrial fate. Uh, now, it's kind of an interesting commentary on the way the propaganda system, the doctrinal system has functioned, that ideas that were standard among, you know, Mill Hands and Lowell a hundred years ago sound unimaginable today. I mean, they were saying, look, the institution's illegitimate. It's uh, infringing on our rights as free men and women. Uh, we're not, they were not asking the autocracy to be more benevolent. They were saying it should disappear because we want to enjoy the rights that we won in the American Revolution, or so they thought. Nowadays, that's almost unthinkable. Uh, and the most that can be asked for is that the uh, absolutism be more benevolent, that the king act a little more nicely. Well, that's a tremendous victory of a propaganda system uh, in which educated sectors have played the leading role, after all. We should re remember that. We're talking about ourselves. Uh, and it has very, uh, it, uh, it's, it's been extremely hard. Uh, for 180 years now, there has been an effort to drive out of people's heads normal, ordinary human sentiment and to make them think just for themselves. You want things just for yourself, you know, instill the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self, you have no rights other than what you can get on the market, with, of course, that big footnote that the rich and the powerful insist on massive protection from the nanny state uh, in extreme forms under, say, Reagan and Gingrich, but always. Uh, and it's been a very hard battle to get that across, but it's, you know, over time it has worked. So now people don't even think about being free. Do you drink Starbucks refreshers? Because I do. And Starbucks is being sued in a massive class action for false advertising. Because you know what's not in the mango dragon fruit drinks? Mango. The pineapple passion fruit? No passion fruit. And my favorite, the strawberry acai. No acai. All of these are mainly just water, grape juice concentrate, and sugar. So Starbucks just went in front of a judge to try to get this whole case dismissed. They said no reasonable consumer would expect these drinks to contain the ingredients that are in their names. Sidebar, I was confused, were you? Well, the judge looked at both arguments and sided with us. It wasn't unreasonable for us to expect mango, passion fruit, and acai in drinks with those same names. He also said it's extra confusing because other Starbucks drinks really do have the ingredients in their name, like iced matcha tea latte, which has matcha, and honey citrus mint tea, which has honey and mint. So the class action is asking for money because we wouldn't have paid such high prices for these drinks if the fruit wasn't in them. Judge ruled our claims are reasonable. The lawsuit is moving forward. We're getting closer to a payday. No, I'll keep you updated on any settlement. Turfs think that trans women aren't helping feminism. Uh, we're turning men into women. What the f are you doing? Tweeting? If you think the patriarchy is bad, wait until I tell you about how it's also infiltrated our perceptions of our. Let's take this a step further and talk about how misogynoir affects the queer community. When I first came out, I genuinely thought that I was ugly. And I know that's crazy. I know that's crazy. But it was very much true. I really tried to go to queer events. I was like doing all the things and to no avail, finding people to like, A, connect with was becoming increasingly 
more and more difficult. It felt like every event I would go to, I'd be like stared at and not in the fun, like queer femme for femme, like are we staring because we're in love? Are we staring because we like each other's outfits? Like it wasn't that, it was staring as in, um, like, why are you here type B. And it was exhausting, extremely exhausting. And it got to the point where I, I felt so unwelcomed in my own home, in my own spaces, my own queer spaces, that I was like, I can no longer be a part of these events. Like, I can't go to any of these events anymore. And so there are very few queer black events in LA, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. So me and my friend went to a queer black event um, for the first time and it blew my mind it blew my mind it blew my mind because for the first time i realized that i wasn't ugly i'm just black in la and um desirability in la is so interesting i mean we could talk about the colorism of it we could talk about the fat phobia of it but right now i want to talk about the misogynoir specifically in the queer community i will also say that it's so interesting how um, white queers love to take our language. They love to take our language, love to take our rhythms and, and not our blues. And it's just so fascinating because all, obviously all queer lingo, anything that's fun, honestly, anything online that is fun and interesting, all by black femmes, all by black trans women, all by black femmes. And it's just interesting that they like take our language, they say all our stuff, but then don't actually wanna ever interact with us. And another thing that I've realized is that I saw this creator, I thought this was so fascinating. I saw this creator on here talking about how she like loved Megan the Stallion. And there's like this reverence for black women that is almost like ethereal. Like we are these untouchable beings because yes, we are incredible and beautiful and wonderful and ethereal and am amazing and magical. But we're also human fucking beings. Like we are human beings who sit in bed and like have feelings and thoughts and somehow that doesn't compute to like white queers somehow. Um, and I saw this creator on here talking about how she like was like, I love Megan Thee Stallion so much. First of all, you could probably not never bag a girl who looked like Megan Thee Stallion, but beyond that, you would never date a black woman. Like that, that would never be in your ether. That would never be in your um, range. Like you like to romanticize black women. You like to fetishize black women, but actually dating and standing behind and standing with a black woman never gonna happen for you. You know how I know? Because you're dating history. Half the white queers on this app, on the dating apps, in life, like not just in LA, I think like pretty much everywhere, have this romanticized version of black women where they're like, oh, they're so beautiful. But they would never want to take us to meet their families. They, they were like a secret. Um, and And by the way, this is like a side note, we know when you don't have black friends. We know when you don't have black friends. I could go on about this forever and ever, but the truth of the matter is y'all romanticize black women and this misogynoir within that is like, it's almost comical. It's almost comical, but it's not funny because it's so incredibly sad. And so anyways, if you're a black femme and you've experienced misogynoir in the queer community, comment. And also I see you. Like, I see you, bro. I'm a licensed therapist, and here are three things that I wish everybody knew about binge eating. Binge eating and just eating a lot of food, not the same thing. Just not buying binge foods, never gonna work long term. Binge eating has nothing to do with willpower or discipline. It's a reaction to unmet needs. One thing about this that I've actually seen Gen Z talk a lot about is that kids have nowhere to go outside anymore. If you're living in suburbia, the best that you have is a sidewalk. And if you're like my parents, you have to look up if there's a sex offender living in your neighborhood to see if your kids are safe to play outside. But because suburbia is essentially populated with old people, there's not a lot of kids living in those neighborhoods. If you're living in a low income area, you might not even feel safe to let your kids play outside. The reason why I can kind of understand parents using screen time as an entertainment filler for their children is because the outside world is dangerous and not fit for children anymore. Even the old rules of be home by the time the street light comes on doesn't keep kids safe. Hey guys, unfortunately we have a fascist in the fashion history community and they're getting a lot of followers because I don't think people are realizing this. So I want to try and nip it in the bud now, okay? So if you are into fashion history, you may have seen this account floating around, fashion history queen. Um, 
and I've noticed a few things. Obviously, she's got quite a few followers and lots of her content is very nice and seems very innocent. But when you take a closer look at the stuff she's posting, it's actually, it's horrendous. It's but the one that tipped me off was this. Her list of period drama recommendations. White only, free from agenda. Hello? What the f***? So then I started digging and it just got worse from there. She has a whole playlist of videos dedicated to anti-women suffrage and that's a big part of her content. The ideology that underpins all of it is that the people in the past were morally superior and better than the people today and that modern feminism, the state of modern fashion is, is some sort of indication of like our moral decline, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. The number one, I think, most shocking thing that she posts, sprinkles throughout her content every now and then, um, is stuff like this. And who does she want to be just like? Now, for those of you who don't know, this woman is Diana Mitford, also known as Diana Mosley. And I cannot stress this enough. She was the most, or at least one of the most prominent fascists in Britain in the 20th century. It was everything that she believed in. It was integral to who she was. All the way up until her death in 2003, she was a proud fascist, a proud sympathiser of Adolf Hitler, and she was one of his friends and a Holocaust denier. And she wants to be just like her. It's riding me up so badly because this girl, she's using fashion history and history as a conduit, as a vehicle to disperse her horrendous, horrific ideology. And it's something, unfortunately, that happens all the time. The history community and the pop history community, it's very easy to slip in these very, very extreme right-wing agendas. The number one thing I would recommend you look for, um, particularly in the fashion history community, but also generally in the history community, um, if you want to look for a red flag, if people talk about history as being a decline from this idea of the past, this conservative idea of the past to the current state of the world, particularly if they refer to it as a moral degeneration, um, that somehow we have, you know, sunk to a, to new depths, that's usually an indication that these people are um, extremely right-wing, if not fascist, which is horrendous for many reasons, but also because it's completely untrue and it weaponizes and waters down history to serve this function. And you take away the fact that there were trailblazers, there were powerful women, there were people who were pushing the boundaries of what was considered right and acceptable throughout history. Yeah, and maybe in another universe it would still be socially acceptable to walk around with titties and ass out like it was in the neoclassical era. But nobody wants to talk about that, or at least you don't, because it doesn't fit your narrative. When I was younger, I wanted to get a tattoo. It was like my favorite thing to think about. I was like, okay, I'm gonna get a tattoo. It's gonna be like a, a owl right here and an octopus right there. It's going up my neck. Then I wanna get a peanut on my face. I just wanted to get tattoos. That's what I wanted. And I also like just was so obsessed with it. So when I was the fry age of 22, I thought I should probably look into getting one. I was like, you know what? I want a tattoo. I want one really bad. So I went around to a bunch of tattoo shops, like a bunch of them. I was like, okay, let's go to the first one. I walk in the first tattoo shop. And he says, hey, how can I help you? I was like, oh, I'd like to schedule an appointment for a tattoo. Can I see some of your work? And he said, sure. Pull on my Instagram. So I'm like, okay, what's your Instagram? And he says something like uh, Kyle Mason something, something, something. I was like, could you type it in? He was like, sure. He looks at my phone, takes my phone. I allow him to take my phone. That's fine and dandy. He goes to his Instagram, follows himself. What? Why did you why did you follow yourself? Anyways, I was, that's not important. You can follow yourself. You need the clout. It's whatever. And I go through and look at his tattoos. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. Where are the black people at? He's like, pardon? Yeah, pardon indeed. Where where are the black people? And he's like, hmm. You know, you've you brought something interesting to my attention. Did I? Did I do that? Was that specifically me? Where are the black people at? Any, any, one, just one person. He was like, I've done black people before. I was like, have you? And he's like, yeah, I've done a few. I'm like, okay, where? And he was like, 
ah, I don't have any on my Instagram. So among all these photos, this professionally done photos, these black and white tattoo photos, these amazing ones, the, not a single black person? He's like, no. And I was like, I'll consider you later. So I go to another tattoo store. And I'm like, hey, I'd like to book an appointment. He says, oh, <laughs> yeah, I got you, bro. What are you, what are you looking to get? And I'm just like, well, let's see some of your art. I want to see your portfolio, see what you have. And he's like, sure. Go to my Instagram. It must be a tattoo thing to just have an Instagram with all your stuff on it. That's just my thought process. So I'm like, okay, all right, go to the Instagram. I'm scrolling through 478 posts, just amazingly done tattoo things. It's a lot of girls, a lot of, like a crazy amount of girls. All white, not a single black person. I'm like, do you have any tattoos you've done on black people? He's like, oh, I do have one. And I was like, one? Well, that's better than the last guy. So he shows me, and it's somebody that, like, I have dark skin. Uh, you guys can obviously tell that. This person was, like, light, light skin. There's light skin, then there's light, light skin. And I'm like, okay, so, like, do you have, like, a darker skin complexion person? He's like, I've done black people before, but I don't have anything. So I'm like, okay, obviously, third time's the charm. There's got to be one more, right? One more, just one more. All I'm asking is one more. Go to our last tattoo shop. This guy's pretty cool. He's actually a black dude, black guy. He's like, what's up, what's cracking? I was like, oh, what's going on? He's like, you looking to get a tattoo? I'm like, yeah, he's like, all right, we don't do walk-ins. I'm like, I'm trying to book an appointment. He's like, all right, cool, so where you wanna get it at? And I was like, I just wanna do something small at first. Maybe like a little like shoulder piece, maybe top shoulder piece, maybe like a kanji or something, you know, something simple. And I was like, can I see your portfolio? He's like, I got you, dog. You're not gonna believe this. Not a single black person. Not one. And I asked him, I was just like, is there a reason, is there, is, there a, is there a particular reason why you don't have a single black person? He was like, oh, the tattoo society don't like that. I'm like, what does that mean? No one explained it to me. No one told me. I still don't know to this day. I'm perplexed. I'm confused. I am at a, my wit's end trying to figure this out. I still don't know. Still don't know. I'm five years later, I still don't know. 27 now. Started getting at 22. Still don't know. I don't even want a tattoo anymore. I don't want piercing. I don't want anything like that. Why is this a thing in the tattoo community? Someone explain it to me. Am I stupid? Am I dumb? Am I an idiot? Am I silly? Am I goofy? Oh, oh, oh. Am I dumb? Why? Why is this a thing? What? Why does everybody have an Instagram that does tattooing that with no black people? What is that? What, what is that? Is that a thing? Why is that so? St why? Why? California State Assembly has now passed a bill that will punish parents with the loss of custody of their kids if they don't accept and enable the confusion of those kids. We are live with America's new favorite game show, Google is Free. This is an all new game show where contestants attempt to use the free search engine Google to try and make some sort of sense out of the crazy videos that we see on the internet. Everyone give a warm welcome to our first ever guest, Marcus. How you doing, Marcus? Well, I'm doing great, Chad, especially after seeing that video. It seems really easy to disprove. Well, hold on there, Marcus. It might not be as easy as you think it's going to be because the creator of that video goes by the name LJ Truth and you know I'm sure if he's gonna have truth in his name he's doing a lot of research to make sure he's not spreading misinformation or fear mongering or telling have truths to rile up his fan base I mean I'm sure he wouldn't be caught dead doing that I didn't know that was his name you're right it might not be that easy don't worry I'm rooting for you pal you ready to go yes Chet I've got my phone I'm ready to go okay you got 60 seconds and your time starts now now, while we're waiting for Marcus to finish... Hey, Chad, I found what he's talking about. He's wrong. Are you serious? Yeah, the bill he's talking about just pertains to custody cases, and it's just requiring the judges in those cases to also take into consideration the parent's support of their child's identity. And it doesn't require judges to side with the affirming parent, nor does it bar the non-affirming parent from accessing the child. I'm sure he touches on that later in the video. Marcus, his name is LJ True. Under the proposed law, parents who fail to acknowledge and support their child's gender transition could face potential consequences, including the loss of custody rights to another parent or even the state itself. Itself, seeks to prioritize health, safety, and welfare of children, placing a spotlight on affirming a child's gender identity. Yes, because affirming a child's gender identity is the most important thing when it comes to the health, safety, and welfare of children. It's never been a parent's job to just affirm whatever their kid says to them. Parents are there to use their knowledge and maturity to help guide their kids in the right direction, not enable them down a path of chaos and confusion. Using your brain isn't a crime that should be punishable by revoking your custody of your your children you heard it here first parents your duty to your kids isn't to provide for them or protect them or use your expansive wealth of knowledge and wisdom to help guide them away from making childish and uninformed mistakes it's to affirm whatever the hell they tell you oh I
I guess he doesn't. Congratulations, Marcus. You just won $10,000. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy spending it, Marcus. You earned it. Just like that, we are out of time. I'm Chad Almanac with Google is Free, reminding all of you that Google is indeed free. I want to talk about how androgyny is seen through a white lens. It's very difficult for people of color to actually be perceived as androgynous because there's already gendered assumptions about race. The pinnacle of androgyny is often portrayed as a skinny white person with like a gender neutral haircut. Uh, like Harry Styles is supposedly the face of androgyny. But white people have a lot more flexibility and freedom to be experimenting with their gender. Meanwhile, people of color tend to be pushed into a binary box for gender. Black people are automatically labeled as more masculine, and Asian people are automatically seen as more feminine. And this hyper-masculinization of black people and hyper-feminization of Asian people are ultimately just two sides of the same coin that is colonial constructs of gender meant to uphold the white supremacy. Because of this anti-black trans misogyny, black trans women in particular are often straight up not seen as women and face the highest rates of violence out of any other group. And because Asian people are read as more feminine, I can literally have the exact same haircut, the exact same height, body shape, whatever, as a white person, um, and I'll still be read as more feminine. So I think it's a lot harder for people of color to actually have control over our gender expression. And trans and non-binary people of color not only have to deconstruct the gender binary, but we also have to deal with internal conflicts regarding how colonial assumptions of gender have impacted the way we see our own race and gender.